So it's going to be organising art supplies, new stuff integrated in and how I'm going to store that. How I organise my colours, that's quite important, it's watching. And all about why I've picked the colours I've picked, so the colour theory behind that. Is the sound actually switched on? I'm very excited. Most of this arrived at my house yesterday. I have to squat because I haven't quite got the camera right. I haven't opened it. I waited to show you. I really held back, so, you know, just for you. So I hope you appreciate it. First of all, I'm really tired. So if I look tired, I'm really sorry. I've been awake about 4 a.m. I haven't really got back to sleep. The ups and downs and ins and outs of life, as you know, you're only too familiar with as well. So that's what's going on. I need to have a little sort out of my art supplies because when I bring new things in, which I don't do very often, the only other time I've done an art haul on here was about two years ago. I don't buy loads of stuff, so only when I've thought about it carefully, I've weighed up the pros and cons. I just get a chair because it's a bit... Let's, have, let's get comfy. Uh, yeah, maybe I need to... Can you see me like this? Hopefully. It's a big parcel, isn't it? It's very big. I have to put this down now. Okay. A few weeks ago, I had another parcel as well, which I'll show. I won't rattle that too much. Without further ado... <laughs> So what's going to be in this video then? I'm not entirely sure because I'm not entirely with it, which is completely allowed around here. So if you're not as well, I know, you know, we're in good company. And I definitely need to have a little tidy up and an organise. So it's going to be organising art supplies, new stuff integrated in and how I'm going to store that and things like that. How I organise my colours in my paint, that's quite important. And probably some swatching as well. And all about why I've picked the colours I've picked for my oil paints, you know, so the colour theory behind that. But really simple because we don't want to get into the other side of our brain, left brain. We want to stay creative, so I don't want to go too much into the science part of it all. The science part is still important. We just need to know it and then not think about it, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? I really can't wait any longer. First things first, let's just rip open, see what we've got. It's actually toothpaste, so I'm not going to yeah, show you that one. <laughs> That's my brush. Focus, please. This is a Winsor & Newton brush, so it was pricey, and I don't usually go in for pricey, but it's got a bit of movement. The wooden bit, the metal bit. I might send that one back, so it's pretty nice. It is the Synthetic Hog, and obviously it's a filbert shape by Winsor & Newton. It, this one is the number 16, but sorry Winsor & Newton, I'm not sure you're going to pass the test. Okay, let's box then. Let's see what I'm doing. Okay, the books. I've got this book, which I've been really wanting for ages and ages. And I'll show you these in a minute, probably. I've also had this one on my wish list for ages and ages as well. So we'll have a good look at those.
gallery that we've got going on. Wow, that's pretty nice. So I've just laid everything out that I've bought. I've got four books and a load of oil painting stuff as well as a few inks and yeah random bits and bobs i've actually saved up for over a year on my affiliate link on my jackson's art supplies there's like an affiliate link on my youtube so if you have bought anything from that affiliate link i get five percent of everything that you've bought and i've saved it up over a long period of time so i can't thank you enough for my beautiful paints so thank you so much and so that's why i've gone a little bit mad obviously it's what i do it's my job so i want to go for you know, high quality art supplies, thinking about archival qualities. Gambling oils is something that, you know, I've had a couple in the past and they're absolutely gorgeous. So I thought I would just go for the whole batch, seeing as I had all this credit in my affiliate link thing. Let me try and get you a better view of my desk. Yes. This is totally like better than Christmas. This is really, really exciting. You can see some of the paint tubes are a little bit mucky already because I've had these oils for a couple of weeks now. Yeah, I'll explain my colour choices and we'll have a little flick through the books, maybe a bit of swatching. Let's start with this then, shall we? So this is a cream and what I've been using actually, one of my patrons bought me this fantastic stuff because I've been having some pain in my fingers, knuckles and wrists. Yeah, I've been using this. It's not affiliated or sponsored, but I, I use that on my hands, you know, when I want to kind of get the paint off if I've been working in oils. And so I thought I'd have another pot of something for the studio. The reason I've bought this one as well is because the ingredients are really pure and it's a big pot so it's going to last me ages. So that's another good thing as well. But this is a real thick balm so it's going to be really moisturising. As a protector I'm not really a person who likes to paint in rubber gloves so that's going to act as a you know a skin protectant and i'll probably put more than i've just put on now it's easier to wash your hands afterwards as well and you can even you know clean the oil paint off with it so it's olive oil beeswax honey royal jelly propolis and sera so it smells really nice it's kind of honey very honey smelling so yeah a bit of a treat there for my hands all-purpose skin cream so just something useful to have in the studio anyway, but really great for oil painting. Then I've got my odorless thinners. So the other odorless thinners I've been using is this De La Rowney one, low odour. You can get one made of citrus as well. I think lemon peels, orange peels. So I might try that at some point as well. It's still not, you know, a really pure chemical free thing. I thought I would try the Gamsol. I've tried the Windsor and Newton before as well, but seeing as I was buying a load of Gamblin, I thought I would buy their particular one. And I also use Windsor and Newton as well for medium. So I've tried, you know, a few different ones. We'll see how that is. So this is a satin varnish and it's also by Gamblin. I thought I would, you know, try one by them as well. You have to wait till your oil paint has completely dried or cured and then you can add a layer of that and it lusters up the colours and also adds a protective layer. You can actually remove this and then reapply it to paintings as well. The longevity of oil paint and oil painting is a long time so it's truly protected. But shall I go through all my colours then? Let's just move the books out of the way for a minute. We've talked about this brush, haven't we? Yeah, this is the big filbert that I wanted. But as I say, it's got, and sorry Windsor and Newton, but I'm not that impressed with the fact that it's got, I don't know if you've, the camera's picking it up, but it's got a little bit of wiggle. James noticed that as well. So but this is the synthetic hog. So I'll probably replace that. I'll send it back and replace it. Complain, definitely. Not impressed Windsor and Newton. Sorry about that. need a little bit of space don't we for our colours so what I'll do first of all is I'll, I'll split them all into colour families and then I will explain to you why I've gone for the colours I've gone for it can be completely overwhelming you know I'll, I'll explain to you what I've done in my choices and you might think oh Wendy you haven't got a white but I do have 
have a couple of whites actually so i have and i have a big one so it's it's really good to have a big white isn't it whatever your um medium of choice is so there's my color families so i've got green selection my neutrals oranges reds more reds into purple and then we've got bl blues yellows and golds i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to explain my color mixing yeah why i've picked the colors i've picked a little bit later because if i get all messy then i won't want to touch my books anything to be swatched you can go over there and then we've got our our books here if i can just zoom in a little bit so i've actually bought these four books brand new often i find things second hand and i think i've mentioned before i've got a really big art book video which i'll link up there somewhere and a lot of the books in that video i either had before we went traveling those are the ones that survived the big book purge that you may or may not know about so yeah if you've been here a while you'll know about that i got rid of basically all my books apart from a few a handful after <laughs> landing after several years of van life i've slowly but surely been accumulating more stuff and in specific books and this issue comes up a lot as well so about art school i did actually go to art school what that means i don't think it matters nor is it particularly relevant to how accomplished you know you can become as an artist and the whole self-taught thing. You know, we're teaching ourselves stuff all the time. And so whether or not you went to art school, I kind of view it that, you know, we, we self-teach and self-educate and move along our path and organically evolve, expand our knowledge, play with different things. And so a lot of things come in together. It's an ongoing incoming isn't it, of inspiration and information. You know, past artists and their experiences, contemporary artists and what they do. And, and I think as well, you know, we've got new developments in art supplies as well, where, you know, certain colors were really, really expensive. You couldn't get true pigment in certain colors because it was just, you know, super duper expensive. Now they can make them much, much cheaper. So it's much more accessible to more people. But yeah, let's, without me going off on a little bit of a wendy waffle there but books matter i think is what i'm trying to say you can acquire books second hand you can acquire that you can even acquire them second hand can't you on on the dreaded old amazon i like my second hand bookshop but it doesn't always stock everything i want and so these are some books that i have literally had on my wish list in my basket almost clicking buy me buy me quite a number of times and i'm gonna start with this one because i like going back to drawing these two together would be perfect wouldn't it so let's talk about color and light in a minute i'm sure i'm not going to be able to say his name right but he's a japanese artist called mao kun yim and then there's iris yim as well and this is lessons in portrait drawing let's have a quick flick through then the paper quality is lovely quick review for you the drawings the quality is absolutely gorgeous. A lot of these are done in pencil and charcoal. I would I would usher a guess, yeah, charcoal pencils. So yeah, I mean if you if you've been around a little while, you know that I like to paint female portraits, female heads, not so much in a realistic way, more of a stylized type thing, but I do bring the realism elements into it as well. So this book is gonna be an absolute find for me. The other thing I really like about it is the more we go into technology and iPads and digital art, and, and you know, I'm not dissing anyone that does that at all. It's very skilled and i know lots of professional artists use it i use my ipad very now and again you know to do certain things digitally as well so and i obviously use a lot of digital tools so i'm not dissing that at all but the more kind of ai people are going the more classical i want to go and i always love coming back to drawing so if you've watched my drawing video that i put up about a month or two ago now, you will notice that I always love to come back to drawing and also I explain, you know, why that is. But let's just have a look. Content, so about drawing the head, classical bust demonstrations, portrait demonstration, and then a gallery of drawings. So yeah, there's a lot of principles to guide in this book. 
I would say it's suitable for beginners and intermediates and experts as well. So we've got some anatomy and the skull and uh, lots to dip into there. This book was, how much was this book? It says 29.99 US dollars on the back, but it certainly wasn't. I think I paid about 12 or 13 English pounds for this book because it was on a special offer, which is another reason why, yeah, I bought it now. And, and then this one is by an artist called Juliet Aristides, an instructional sketchbook. So this book's slightly different. The best way to learn about art is to make it. And this is all about the figure. So again, faces and figures is my personal subject matter of choice, but this just looked like a lovely book. Again, the paper's lovely. I'm allowed to show nudity on YouTube. I'm not sure I am. And you've actually got spaces to draw in the book, in the exercises. So again, it's a little bit of a, a book of lessons an instructional sketchbook. And that's kind of what I wanted. I wanted something that was, yeah, just gonna take me back to the beginning, if you like. Take me back to the beginning and take me through and then move me even f more forwards than, you know, where I'm at. I think, I think going back to the beginning in a repeating fashion is a really lovely way to learn because you're never at a place where you're like, right, I know, I know everything. So you can always go back and learn another layer deeper into the basics even. It's all going to add tools into your toolbox, into your repertoire of skills, isn't it? So yeah, this is a really beautiful book. I'll just give you a little look and Try not to include too much nakedness because there is obviously some nakedness. So again, look, you've got a little spot here to practice your shading on. So it's a little bit different, this book. It shows you examples and it's also a teaching book, you know, and that's what you want if you're going to self-learn. You know, I left art school in 1996, so I need to still up my skills. I didn't, I didn't leave art school with all my skills and knowledge and be proficient at everything by any means. Okay, so that's my drawing stuff and that's why I've bought that. And then I'm, I'm, I really love colour and so this is another book I've wanted for ages. And this is Cassia Sinclair, The Secret Lives of Colour. So. You can learn about how the colours were created. You can use your paints and also do some investigations if you want to go, you know, a little bit deeper as well. I know orange is very much in affinity with the Netherlands. And it even mentions it here, the House of Orange in early modern Europe with its heraldic colour. Obvious association with the Netherlands. The Dutch, the Dutch teams play in Oranje. Yeah, it's really interesting what the colour is linked to, how artists use the colour, Kandinsky, the Impressionists, along and within the spectrum, you know, that there are emotional responses to colour, you know, if we think of, you know, the obvious ones like anger down here and then more relaxing, cool colours down here, so how we see, and obviously colour is all about light and so I'm really looking forward to, you know, having a look at this book. There's another book I want as well by James Gurney, so I'll see if this is good. And if it is, I might even order his other book. But how we see some simple arithmetic, so a little bit of science on light, building the palette, artists and their pigments, vintage paint chart, so, you know, going back in history and pigments that are used these days are not the same. You know, ultramarine blue is made differently now. It used to be really expensive. These are very expensive even now. Yeah, there are some, still some expensive expensive ones. Chromophobia, the politics of colour, colourful language, and then we've got all the different colours as we go through the book. Glossary of other interesting colours, endnotes, bibliography. 
If you're not interested in colours and history of colours and the background of colours, then maybe that's not the book for you. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to dipping into that regularly. And then finally, my final book is James Gurney, A Guide for the Realist Painter, Colour and Light. So let's have a quick flick through then, shall we? The blurb on the back. This is the book I wish I'd had in art school. This is the textbook that we've been searching for, but it never existed until now. So good reviews on the back. It's saying it doesn't just give colour recipes. Now my other colour book, which you may have seen in the last book video, which is actually pretty much falling apart because I use it quite a lot. It's a great book, but it doesn't talk about a lot of important stuff. So cool and warm, like the split primary palette, it doesn't really talk about any of that. It is helpful, but it's very left brain actually. Let's have a flick. Again, all these books feel really nice. You know, sometimes you order a book and it's a bit disappointing because it feels really cheap and nasty paper. All of these books feel really nice in case you feel like buying them. I want to create some more ethereal qualities in my paintings, you know, with my fairies or underwater with the mermaids or something like that. So it's going to be a super helpful and very insightful. I'm going to learn a lot in this book. I can feel it now. I'm kind of getting excited. My juices are going, if you like. So light and shadow. And lots of beautiful pictures to dream about and inspire. Let's go to the contents. Chapter one, tradition. Two is sources of light. Three, light and form. Elements of color is four. Number five, paint and pigments. Color relationships. So we're talking about warm and cool in here straight away. So it's going to move me further than this colour mixing book, which don't get me wrong, it's pretty comprehensive, but pre-mixing. Chapter eight is visual perception. Surfaces and effects is chapter nine. Atmospheric effect, something that I'm really interested in is chapter 10. Lights changing show, 11. And it's a bit like Monet's where he did series of paintings like the um, the cathedral paintings and things like that in different lights. Chapter 12 resources so yeah very interesting. So those are the four books I have acquired. It's better than my birthday that's for sure. So all that's left to do is to grab a palette and some paper and I'm going to swatch and mix and talk about the colours I've picked. So let's have a play. Yes, the best bit. And get messy if we want to. Yes. I do have some glass palettes, which are actually pictures, old pictures and picture frames, but I'm a really big fan of the convenience of the paper palette. So yeah, that's what I'm gonna use today. But I have some paint on here that's still usable, so. do it in colour families and and then you know write on them so the first one and you can see as well which ones are more opaque and then which ones are more translucent you would tend to use the translucents for glazes and you know the early parts of the painting this is a green gold sap green fallow green emerald and permanent green light have I spelt that wrong? No. <laughs> I'm really tired, folks. I apologise. So there's the greens. Don't really need to write green, do I? But anyway, yeah, and you can see them how bright they are on that grey as well. Helps to have a little bit of a grey palette. 
let's just keep that as clean as possible. I think we'll go with blues next. I just want to try a little bit more of that um, sap green. I'm just using mixed media paper and I haven't gessoed it or anything, so it's soaking into the paper, which I kind of quite like because then I can kind of see the dry brushing effect. Look at that quinacridone violet, for example. Yummy, yummy. So I just want to quickly talk about, you know, why I've picked the colours I have. Obviously, you've got your warm and cool colours. So you've got your greens and blues, cool. Yellow, red is warm. And then your pinky purples are a mix. So depending on whether they lie more towards the blue or the red if you like. But within those colour families you've also got warms and cools. For example, you've got cadmium yellow, which is a really cool yellow, like a lemon. And then cadmium yellow medium, which you can see there is like a buttery, really warm yellow. And this matters when you're colour mixing. If we go back to our primary school days, which, you know, I can go back quite easily because I was a primary teacher for years. You go back to your, you know, your red, your blue and your yellow as your primary colours. But if you mix these together, it doesn't give you the purest possible colour. So these three are not true primary colours, ultramarine blue, cad red and cad yellow, even though that's kind of what we taught at primary school and what you probably remember when you did your colour wheel. And you might remember as well what kind of green you got when you mixed those two together and also the kind of purple you got. I think the oranges were kind of okay, but say if you used a more cooler selection, for example, so you've got your cooler blues. Now, there is a bit of an argument actually <laughs> about which blue is warm and which is cool. My personal stance on it is there's more red in this one. I consider that to be a more warm blue and these to be more cool. And indeed the Prussian blue as well. And then I've got some cooler reds. So you can see here the quinacridone violet. It looks very pink on here. And then the alizarin crimson as well. So a cooler, it's more blue in these than there is the cadmium. And then the cool yellow. So if I mix these together, I'm going to get a brighter green than I would if I mixed those two together, where I'm going to get more of that kind of green, if that makes sense. So that's the thing to bear in mind with your colour mixing. And I try not to, you know, get into the colour science when I'm actually painting as well. As long as you're aware of things, a really good way to learn colour is to mix. You know, spend a couple of hours mixing colours on your palette, making colour charts, swatch them all, mix them in with white, mix them in with some of your darker colours as well, see what happens and you know have a play and experiment make notes as you go along if you want to as well and you can plaster those all over your walls and that's great 
and really helpful. But for me, it's kind of like I work intuitively with colour. So I, I know, for example, if I mix those two together, I'm going to get a brighter green than if, if I mix those two together. But you know, you don't always want the super, what, what I kind of call the cartoony Disney colours. And so you need to know your colour wheel a little bit and you need to know the opposite colour. So if you wanted to grey out, neutralise some of that colour, you would add in some of the orange. And because that's a cool blue, I would go with my cooler version of orange to get the brightest possible. That's its proper opposite. So I can't find my big colour wheel, but I can show you. And this is the colour mixing recipe book by William Powell. And as I say, it doesn't say a lot about warm and cool in here it's just got you know split here and then within families you've got warm and cool colors that's the only mention in here but you do need to know how to mix the brightest possible color instead of mixing with ultramarine blue try a cobalt blue or a cobalt teal yellow lemon instead of the cadmium mid and then try alizarin crimson or a quinacridone violet for your red instead of choosing you know what you think the bright primary red would be because they're not the true primaries so if you think about c n k y is it c n k y colors no anyway for printing that is me just swatching all my colors and having a play and it shows you how they behave it shows you you know how transparent or how opaque they are you can see here how the Payne's grey is it's really cool grey here. Ivory black is fairly neutral and then I've got my two umbers, cool raw umber and then a warm burnt as well and how that links with the, the warms over here as well. And the golds, I have to say, look great. I've already played with those actually, so yeah. If you were going to really limit your palette and just have a little play with oil paints, I have got a really nice set of Windsor and Newton, just some basics. If I was going to, you know, just have a little explore of a new medium, you know, just buy yourself a little set. These are actually quite nice quality. So you can go for a more budget range as well. And as long as you've got some thinner to mix it with, they tend to be a little bit more sticky maybe. So you might need a little bit more thinner as well. Don't forget, you know, you can recycle. So I've just emptied my other jar of thinner here. Oh, into where, where have I put it? Hang on a sec. Let me show you the mess. I've just emptied it into there so that will settle and it will turn into this where I can just gently pour and filter off the top. You can see there. And no, it's not pure white like the one from the bottle, but it's clean enough to work with so you can keep recycling it if you like because that's some that I just filtered off the top. And in fact, I just rinsed a brush in that as well. So just to get it really clean and then have some rags handy. You know, I tend to have a towel to get the thick off. Oh, look what's just happened to my brush, you see. I tend to get really budget brushes because <laughs> I'm not good to them, but yeah. And of course, the one time I splash out on that nice big filbert from Windsor & Newton, it's not great. If I was gonna buy and I had limited budget, I would get a small white. I know this is a big one, but I'd probably buy a cool blue. So one of those. I'd buy my lemon yellow, definitely, and I would buy probably that one as well. So I'd probably just, if you were really going to minimise, those are the colours I would go for. And then if you have a little bit more to splash out on, I would probably go for, I love alizarin crimson, cobalt blue, and these three as well. That would be my more extended kind of palette. And then a black as well is always handy and I would absolutely always want a burnt and raw umber in my selection as well. That's more than you need but that's kind of the size I would probably go for or even smaller than that actually. So these tubes are 21 mil and these ones are 37 mil and then that big ones are 200 but you're always going to need more white so so while I've got some colours on my palette, I might just, you know, we could just do a quick demo of those colours, couldn't we? So bring in my palette here. I might change my brush, <laughs> grab a piece of paper and I can show you on, on white because obviously that's grey. And yeah, this is just this paper, completely unprimed, ungessoed. So let's try mixing the brightest possible green like we said then. So we've got the here, we've got the cobalt teal. Okay, you can immediately see how bright that is. You can bring a bit more blue, a bit more yellow. That's the brightest green you're going to get. 
let's just put a little bit down here. And if we look at our greens that we've got, we're closest to the permanent and el emerald. If I added a little bit of yellow in that, but you can see how bright that is. Now let's compare that to what I'm calling warm blue, but some people call cool blue. We can go into all that another day. I think this was my ultramarine blue. And we're going to mix that with the warm yellow to see if we can get a nice green. And we will get a nice green, don't get me wrong. Let me just show you on here. Mix that with a little bit of thinners so you can actually see the colour of that. And that's very similar, isn't it, to the, to the sap, the sap green. So that was the ultramarine blue and the cadmium. And that's the kind of blue that you would have, you know, mixed at primary school. And it's a bit disappointing because it's not bright green like that. So you see the difference when you're mixing. Now you can mix warm yellow with a cool blue as well and have a, have a good play. But we're talking about here the brightest possible colours that you can mix. And then once you know that you can, you know, have a play with it. So let's try a purple then. With purple, we would have had, at primary school I'm talking, an ultramarine blue with the bright red. So let's have a look and see what we get with those. I'm just covered in blue now, hang on a sec. So yeah, let's try the purple that you get with those. Add a bit more red, add a bit more blue. You can see on here, again, just mix a little bit of the thinners in with that just so we can see on the paper on the white but you can see on the gray as well that's the purple we get with that one so now let's try with our cooler blues so let's try let's need to add a little bit more of this gorgeous color with quinacridone violet so let's grab that as our blue and that as our red. We might need a bit more quinacridone just to play with levels of warm and cool. Let's have a look and see if that's brighter. Put a bit more of the quinacridone in there. Much more toned down than this bright one. Let's just add a little bit of our white and you can really see what colour that is a mix grab a bit of white off here and then there you go you can see really clearly now got a nice tint anything you mix with white is a tint and it will also go opaque so any of the translucents will go more opaque much more of a true purple anyway have a go yourself and mix some of the cools with cool and the warms with warms and then mix together some of your cools and warms together if you're going to mix a cool blue with a warm blue you've got to remember that that warm blue has got some red in it so it's going to neutralize and muddy up and i think this is what we're talking about here we want the purest possible colors with the least possible infection mudded up if you like so it's the true primaries that are going to give you the true colors and it is i think much more rewarding to mix your colors yourself and not use things you know i know now and again we do but not use things so much straight out the tube i think it's much more satisfying and you get a much more broad sophisticated range of colors yes but yeah aren't they juicy yes now i know we've got a little bit lost in oils here so let's just come back to some ink. I have got, I'm going to put a little bit of this on the grey so you can see, but I wanted a nice opaque white ink. I can get extra opaque, titanium white, which is a nice neutral. I didn't mention that when I was talking about the oil white. I do recommend titanium. It's a good neutral white. You can get warm and then ones that tend to be more cooler as well. But that was what I, I bought this for, to see if it was a little bit more opaque than my um, Liquitex one that I already have. I bought three colours in my Liquitex and I've never tried this iridescent bright gold. So I just thought, well, you know, while we've got you there, let's just see how nice that is. It's pretty nice, isn't it? Shake it up a bit, see if it comes any more opaque. 
Yeah, so I've got a nice gold there, which is fun. Um, I've got some gold watercolour, so I like to play with that as well, but I just wanted to try that. These are refills because I absolutely love. That is water, by the way, I changed it. You know, look at that, the colours of that, so. And then the same with the turquoise deep as well, one of my favourites. just to show you let's just put some wet into that so look how is that picking up hopefully the camera is picking that up because it's whoops it's absolutely gorgeous before she says making a mess but you know you can push them together as well which is yeah play 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 with the inks let's just get rid of the ink on that palette so I don't want to mix water and oil and then I can get rid of that so I can clean that off as well come back to you in a sec when I've uh, cleaned up a little bit clean myself up I'm a mucky little pup as my mum would say another little tip that I use here just for cleaning my brush is you know if you've got thick paint on you can buy one of the special um, terps containers and it, and it has like a brush cleaning ability in it where you've got like a thing you can scrape off but I really like using tin cans and then I mean you've got to be careful because it's a bit of a sharp edge obviously but you know you can really get rid of all the junk clean your brush off and then I go in for a last time when I'm cleaning my brushes and you know if I'm going to be painting the next day I uh, and this is obviously for oils I would just say you know that's clean and then if I'm, if I'm going on holiday or I'm leaving my brushes for a week or I'm going to be moving into watercolours or another medium I will use bar of soap and I just you know give it a good wash with soap and I have a towel or a flannel and I just give it a wiggle as well so yeah but that is free you don't have to buy one of those expensive thingamy bobs I do tend to go for the budget brushes and that happens and then I tape them back together yes so that was fun so all that's left really to show you is how I integrate and organize my new supplies with what's currently in here and that matters because it has to be workable and it also has to facilitate one keeping as tidy and organized as possible and I know that's a challenge for many of us yes me included. And you can see the acrylic paints here. I don't want to hang them on a thing like that. I just want to keep them in a box and keep them in a dark, cool place. Not have them, you know, tipped because then the oil content will go to the, the end where it's tipped, if that makes sense. And so I want to store them flat, which is how you should store things like paint pens and other pens and alcohol markers and things like that. A lot of art supplies are better off stored flat, but my acrylic paint is fine hung up like that and I absolutely love that whole organisation thing as well. You can kind of see behind me as well I've got this painting as well which is pretty much touch dry now it's still curing so I haven't varnished it yet but is that going to focus? So if you're still here after all this time, because I think this video is going to be far too long, leave me a comment down below and tell me what is on your wish list for art supplies. But this is the box I've got and I was kindly gifted this box. Let me just zoom out. At the point I was sharing a studio, I shared with another artist and he gave me a couple of these and they're so, so good. But you can see I've got all my sections so I can put blues, greens, browns, gold, neutrals into different compartments and my yellows, yellow ochres, golds. I can put them all together and then I can grab them really, really quickly, even when I've got messy hands. Checking that all my lids are really tight as well. And then I'll put my, my chart on my wall, which is very useful. <laughs> And that actually lives on the first shelf of my trolley, so it's even more ideal. So well done for making it to the end, because I think this is a long one. And thank you so much, as always, for keeping me company. I really appreciate it and your support in here and all your lovely comments and everything. And if you're not already subscribed, you could subscribe down there if you wanted to. Try to keep your lights shining bright and I will see you in the next one. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.